morning, everyone, and welcome to The Lift. My name is Sarah. My name is Caroline. We are so excited that you joined us today. Go ahead and take a minute and fill out our digital connection card. You will see it on the screen. Um, and just let us know who you are. Also, while you're doing that, let us know your favorite coffee. So me and Sarah got coffee this morning. I got caramel ice. And I got cookie dough, which is a little different for me, but it was good. Yeah. So tell us your name and tell us your favorite coffee. All right, guys, next Sunday is Father's Day. Can you believe it? So we are going to have services at our normal times, 9, 15, and 11. So make sure that you are there. You will not want to miss it. We are also going to have Dad's Fest next Sunday. So make sure that you come so you can celebrate your dad or a father figure in your life. Yes, so to keep updated with all the things that are going on, you can download our Lyft app. Um, that's a good way for you to stay connected. Also, see the sermon, um, all the songs and everything. So, <laughs> also, you can uh, follow us on YouTube and just subscribe that way. So if you're not able to see this service or another service, or if you want to go back and watch them, you can find that on YouTube. And stick with us today. Today's sermon will be on instilling faith into our children's and into our families' lives. So we are really looking forward to today. Yes, for sure. So go ahead and stay tuned, and we want to worship with you. Get your coffee in hand, and we're excited, and we'll see you there. <laughs> What's going on, church family? Come on, let's stand. We're going to sing to Jesus because he's worthy. He has won every battle, and he always will. So come on, every voice, let's sing this together. Here we go. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain new. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Come on, every voice all over this place, you say. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You say, Almighty you go. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of God.
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh we live for you
Good morning. Wow, what a great group of people. Good to see y'all this morning. Hey, if you're online, we just want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us as well. Will you take just a moment, greet the people around you just for a moment there, please. And if you're online, please let us know you're there. Maybe in the chat room, uh, greet our, our guests there as well. And let us know that you're watching this morning. Okay, you can be seated. Hey, if you're here for the very first time, hopefully you've already been greeted. If not, we would love for you to fill out a connection card. You can scan the code on the screen and it'll go straight there. Fill out that card. If you've not already received a gift, we have one for you as you leave this morning. Uh, just let one of our volunteers know that they, they'll take care of you. Hopefully you've already received a very warm welcome. Hey, we're excited you're here today. Next Sunday, anybody know what next Sunday is? Father's Day, and it's called, it's called Dad Fest for us, and we're gonna have a wonderful time. Uh, we're gonna be giving away some prizes next week. Each service, one father will receive uh, a special prize, and we give away what we call a man crate, and uh, it's exciting to be here. So when you come in, dads, you'll get a ticket, and hopefully one of you obviously will win that and we'll have a great time. Also, we got something special at the end of the service for everybody, and we're gonna celebrate dads next week, and it's gonna be a wonderful, wonderful time. Let me just say thank you for being here today, and uh, in just a few moments, after a couple more songs of worship, uh, we have a very special guest here today, and uh, our guest today is Rick Calloway. Rick is, go ahead, yeah. Rick, Rick is head of our school. He's been here for 25 years. I told him this morning, he started when he was 15 years old. That's hard to believe. You, you'll get that in just a minute. And uh, anyway, we just wanna say, Rick, thank you for being here with us. Uh, we've already had really just an incredible first service. And uh, I'm, I'm just gonna challenge you to lock in this morning in the message. It's a wonderful message for all of us to hear. And I believe that God's gonna speak to you in a very special way. And also we have a special prayer request before we do our offering this morning. And uh, Josh and Caroline and your family, come on down, okay? There you go. And I'm gonna turn it over to Emmanuel. What's up everybody? So. Um, we're gonna take a moment today and do something special that's near and dear to my heart. Not only are these some special people to me there in my L group, we've been doing life together for over a year now. It's been awesome. But um, a little bit about myself, I'm actually a military kid, but I was in the army for 26 years. And uh, what we get to pray for today is Josh and his family because uh, some of you know this, but Josh is deploying. This is his last Sunday. And so, the crazy thing about deployment is it, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. And so as Josh prepares to take off on his deployment, I wanna take an opportunity for us as a church family to surround them and pray for them um, because this is what I do know. It does take a village, but it also takes a quality church family to see a family through a deployment because there are gonna be some nights and there are gonna be some days where there's some loneliness and there's some distance in between these two and there are going to be some things that he has to do overseas to protect this nation and I know well because I watched my mom walk through it your mind can go to some crazy places just trying to fathom what's going on over there as your your loved one is over overseas so this is what I want to do uh, if you're close to them if you would stand and come up here we're gonna lay hands on them and and pray for them 
as they prepare to, to send Josh off on deployment. Um, so yeah, y'all come on. As they come, y'all, I said this in the first service, but I wanna say it again. I wanna encourage you with this. The same God that brought you to this point, the same God that brought y'all together, is the same God that's gonna carry you through this deployment because it is not easy. And there are gonna be some things that you can't tell her and, and all that stuff and your brain's gonna wander and things are gonna happen. The kids are gonna have their days and whatever the case may be. But like I said, God is the same today as he will be halfway through your deployment. He's the same as, how, uh, what he's, as who he's gonna be at the end of your deployment. And my, I charge you guys, hold on to his hand. It's not gonna be easy. Sometimes it'll feel easier to let go of his hand, but he will never let you go. So you don't let him go. So come on, y'all, let's pray. If you wanna stretch your hands, stretch your hands as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this family. God, we love them, but you love them more. And so God, as they prepare for this deployment, as Josh gets ready to go, and stand in the line of duty for, for his family, but for our country, God, we thank you for him. But God, we ask that you cover, keep, and protect him. God, I know what he say, he's saying yes to is crazy. But God, you have created him for such a time as this. You have equipped him for every good work that he's gonna put his hands to overseas. And so God, I pray for Caroline and, and, and the kids as they're still here and they, they feel so far away from Josh, God, I pray that you would strengthen them. But God, even in the moments where it feels so easy to withdraw from those that are around them, God, I pray that you would give them the strength to draw closer, not only to you, but to their community and to their church family. And God, in those late night hours where encouragement is needed and comfort is needed, God, I pray that the one that they would look to you, but God, they would reach out to their community and their family because we are here and we do life better together. So cover them and keep them. We believe you for it. And God, I thank you that you're gonna continue to keep Josh safe. God will bless your name for all these things. In your son's mighty name we pray. Amen. I love you guys. So church family, let's stand together as we continue to sing and as we worship. May we always remember that the God that we serve is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to, to stress about it. He has never failed. He's not in the business of failing, and he won't start now. So come on, y'all. Let's continue to sing today. Oh, yeah. 
This week, I was thinking about the story of Mary and Martha and how Jesus came into their home. And both of these ladies had totally different perspectives. Martha, she had this earthly perspective that I feel like a lot of us tend to have where we're so consumed with what we have to do. You know, our long laundry list, the kids gotta go here, gotta clean the house, gotta do this, this, this. And here Jesus is probably in her living room and she misses him. He's there and she's more concerned with what she has to do. And then you've got Mary who has this heavenly, this eternal perspective where she just wants more of Jesus. And it made me think about this. We become what we behold. Behold means to fix your eyes on something. So if your eyes are on the cares of the world and everything going on around you, gonna lose sight, you're gonna lose focus, you're probably gonna be stressed, overwhelmed. But when you behold Jesus and your eyes are solely fixed on Him, you have a peace unlike any other. So I wanna encourage you today, become what you behold. Behold Jesus, fix your eyes solely on Him. Fix our eyes on you, Lord. Eliminate all other distractions. Behold him now. The king has entered in. Behold him now. The weight of glory here. As he arrives in victory, open your eyes to majesty. Behold him now. Behold him now. Let's sing. train of your robe fills this temple as the train of your robe fills this temple we just want more of you nothing else will do behold him
eternity. Come on, every voice in this place, let's sing holy. Holy, holy, holy. give you praise in this place. God, it's an honor to be in your presence. Now, sometimes we get so enamored with the things that we wrestle with, the situations we're in, and the sin we struggle with. God, we don't feel 
adequate to be in your presence. And truth be told, we're not. But because of you and your love that you showed us, you beckon us, you draw us to your side. And so God, I say thank you for allowing us to be in your presence, to worship and lift your name on high. And so God, as we prepare to hear your word, pray that you would open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to receive. May we be challenged today. We'll forever give your name glory, honor, and praise because it's only due to your name. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Wow. I have thoroughly enjoyed worship, both services. I told the 915 crowd that I sat out there, just got absorbed in it, got to thinking, wow, about anybody could preach after this. And then I remembered it was me. I was a little nervous there, but uh, I'm grateful for Emmanuel. And you know, it's amazing, just a little side note. A couple years ago, um, a friend of mine in another ministry called one day and said, hey, Rick, if you guys get ever need in a, of a worship pastor, I know this great guy named Emmanuel Sloan. And I didn't think nothing of it at the time because we didn't have a need. But about two weeks later, there was a need. And God just worked it out for Emmanuel to be here. Y'all give him a big hand. I just love that guy. I'll tell you what. Mm. Sure, I'm glad I had enough sense to give that name to Lance. But uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I want to talk to you today about something that's a passion of mine that Lance asked me to preach on, um, especially in lead up to Father's Day called Developing a Lifelong Faith in Your Kids. Uh, and we're going to look at two primary passages of Scripture this morning, Mark chapter 10 and Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you, want to, if you have your Bible and you want to, and you want to go there. Um, I, I've really had the privilege of, walk, of working around children here at MCA and students around at MCA for 25 years. And, and I am a little older than what Clay said. I was born in 19, none of your business. Uh, I've heard some, you know, but I've, I've seen some great things. I got a lot of my students here today and I, I love to see them walking in truth. Uh, but I've, I've also had a good time with kids over the years and I, I've heard some pretty funny things from kids over the years as in my role. So, you know, a lot of you are, are, are Metrolina families and uh, your kids have told me some pretty funny things about you. Things you don't want me to know. So sometimes if you see me around campus and you see this weird grin on my face, it's because I know stuff about you. But you know, also too, I, I've just listened to kids get maybe be, be funny when they tell me a story. They get things a little bit off in terms of scripture. Uh, never forget years ago, um, elementary Bible class came out and I asked this little girl who was in, in that Bible class, I said, what'd you learn today in Bible, honey? And she says, well, Jesus taught the golden rule, which teaches you to do unto others before they do it to you. <laughs> and another little boy, I, I won't forget him either. I asked him the same question one day and his, his answer was classic. He said, well, Mr. Callaway, Paul preached that a man should have one wife and that's called monotony. <laughs> I said, son, I think you meant monogamy, but we're so, we'll, we'll get there. And then a few years ago, um, one of our first grade teachers said, Mr. C, would you come and, and talk to the kids in my class about what it takes to go to heaven? What does it take to go to heaven? And so I go in there just excited. And I thought to myself, well, what I'll do is I'll ask the kids first to see what their answer is. I said, so kids, what, do you, what does it take to go to heaven? And I'll never forget this little blonde haired, blue eyed, beautiful little girl. She raised her hand. I said, honey, what is it? What does it take to go to heaven? And she looked back at me with all the seriousness she could muster and say, well, you have to die first. <laughs> a lot of truth in that statement. It's been an absolute joy to work, to work with students and kids all these years. Uh, but I don't think there's ever been a time in my lifetime where reaching kids with the gospel and giving them a biblical worldview has been more important. Helping them gain what's needed for a lifelong faith. Why is it so important? Well, because a lifelong faith is not something that's happening a lot of times in our culture today. I read a report not long ago from Lifeway Research that said this, 
that 70 to 80% of our kids are leaving the faith and leaving church after high school. 70 to 80%. Now some come back, but nowhere near that number. Nowhere near that number. That same report said also this, only about 6% of young adults, 18 to 22, have a biblical worldview. Ladies and gentlemen, this culture is working overtime to steal our kids, to destroy them, to turn them away from God. And I heard a prominent preacher being interviewed not long ago, and he was asked the question by the person interviewing him. They said, do you think we're losing the culture war as Christians? He says, no, we're not losing it. We've lost it. We've got to get some ground back. We've got to recover some ground. And how do I know all this? Well, we've seen a breakdown in the traditional family like never before, like never before. Folks, we have a sexual identity crisis in this country that we could have never dreamed possible years ago. So this morning, I want to speak to you about one of the hardest things in life you can ever do, and that's parent, and develop a lifelong faith in your kids. Now, if, if you have older kids that are grown, don't you tune me out. The Bible has specific things to say about grandparents. It tells grandparents in, in Deuteronomy chapter four, verse nine, that you're to teach your kids the things of God and to teach your kids' kids the things of God. If you're here this morning and uh, you don't have kids, don't tune me out. You probably will one day. You need this message. But more importantly, what we need today is for all hands on deck. We're at a crisis point. Changing the traje trajectory, I know I can say that word, trajectory of this generation is going to be hard. I work, in, I work with this generation every day and, I, and I'm blown away. I'm not down on it. I believe that there's incredible potential. I see some of these students in this room today who I know are living for Jesus. But we need more. We need more. Like I said, grandparents, you know, I, I don't have any grandkids yet. My kids are grown um, and, and my girls, uh, they, they're not married yet. If you know any godly husbands, send them my way. But grandparents, when, and spoil your grandkids. But I'm going to tell you something. Don't miss spoiling them with the gospel. So I'm here this morning. And I'll tell you, as, as a parent of older kids, I'll tell you this morning, I'm not a perfect parent. My wife's not a perfect parent. My kids were not perfect. But I've studied God's word. I, I'm on the other side of child rearing. And I, and I know what the word says. and I know, what, I know a little bit about what works. So my heart this morning is to challenge you, to encourage you, not to get on you, but to challenge you and encourage you. So let's get right into it. I want to share three factors this morning that I believe are important to developing a lifelong faith. And some of this stuff holds true whether you have kids or not, just for you. The first factor I want to share with you this morning is what I would call the priority factor. The priority factor. Uh, you know, I believe strongly that children crave the blessings and the protections of their parents. I mentioned to you Mark 10. Let's look at Mark 10 uh, verses 13 through 16 quickly. Bible says there one day, this is, Jesus, uh, this is not Jesus' words, but it plays into what he's going to say. One day parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with the disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms and he placed his hands on their heads and he blessed them. So I love this scene in Mark 10. There's some moms who wanted to bring their kids to Jesus for him to bless them, for him to bless them. Now the disciples didn't want this to happen. They say, oh, no, no, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is not his priority. He's too busy. Not his priority. Now, the good news is Jesus wasn't having any of it. He said, oh, no. The Bible says he got angry with the disciples. He said, no, you let them come to me. You let them come to me. Now, and Jesus is here in this passage of scripture. He's loving, he's blessing, he's honoring these kids. He honored them with his affection. Don't miss this. The God of this universe got on the same level 
as these kids. And he prioritized them with love and he blessed them. In this passage, folks, Jesus is modeling for us how to love and prioritize our children. How to love and prioritize them. Are you prioritizing your kids? Are you honoring them with your love and affection? Now notice what this passage of scripture does not say. It doesn't say, give your kids everything they want. It doesn't say to allow bad behavior. It doesn't say mow down every obstacle in life they're ever going to face. It doesn't say those things. It says love them. So how do you love them? How specifically do we love them? I believe one way is with our words. Proverbs 18, 21 says this. The tongue has the power of life and death. You see, our touch and our words are so important. They're so important. I have, we have over 1,400 kids in our school. Man, I do my best to try to tell as many as I possibly can, as often as I can, how much I love them. I try to tell my kids growing up how much I love them. But you know, also too, to love our kids, we got to get in their world a little bit. Be a little nosy. Are you too busy for that? You know, I mentioned protection as well. This prioritizing factor, we got to get in their world not only to love them, but to, but to protect them. I was always careful about what my kids watched, what they listened to, who they hung out with. And God put a verse on my heart when I was a young parent. And it's, it's a different verse, but I think you'll get it in a minute. It was, it, it, these were words that Solomon uttered on his deathbed in Proverbs 4, 23. That passage says this, above all else, guard their heart. Above all else, guard their heart. Well, God put in my heart that day when I, when I, when I, when I was a young parent that if I'm to guard my own heart, how much more should I guard the heart of my girls? How much more? To protect them. You know, my dad, he, he, I don't know where he got it from, but he used to, when I became a, a parent, he, he gave me a little bit of advice. He said, son, sometimes you need to build a fence at the top of the hill for your kids so that you don't need an ambulance at the bottom of the hill. A lot of wisdom in that. This priority factor also includes our time. Now I hear a lot of people talk about, well, I'm going to spend quality time with my kids as opposed to quantity time. Well, let me say this. I, well, here's what I believe today. With kids, I believe all time is quality time. If we're going to develop a lifelong faith in them. You don't know much about me. Some of you don't, but I, I grew up, I was, I was, I, I was, a, I was all boy. But then I, became, I was an athlete, learned, you know, to be like a man's man type, type deal. And I got married and God blessed us with three girls, which I believe it shows that God has an enormous sense of humor with a, with a guy like me. And I'll never forget when my oldest was little, uh, my wife took her shopping one day and they bought this uh, board game she wanted. And this board game was, in t was called Pretty Pretty Princess. I'm thinking, why can't we come home with a basketball or a baseball? Well, we come home with Pretty Pretty Princess. And what made that, that game worse was the, was the fact that she didn't want to play with her mom. She wanted to play with me. Pretty, pretty princess. But it became obvious to me and moved my heart because she said, Dad, I want you to play with me. It was important to her. So I decided, why not? I'll play pretty, pretty princess because it moved her. She wanted that time with me. Now the problem became me being a pretty competitive guy. I wanted to win. And pretty soon I wanted that crown. I wanted to be the pretty, pretty princess. But it was important to her. So it became important to me. Hear me. We only have a few years to invest before they're grown. I blinked. And mine went from five to 25. Please don't assume with this priority factor that your kids know you love them and that they're a priority to you. 
The second factor I want you to see this morning is what I would call the intentionality factor. Now, these next two are going to be a little hard. I'm sorry, but they're a little hard. You know, this church has been so intentional for years. So intentional at trying to reach kids with the gospel and give them a biblical worldview. You see it in our preschool ministry. You see it in our children's ministry. You see it in our youth's ministry. You see it in 316 where we're trying to reach kids with the gospel through sports. You've seen it in in, in Metrolina where we've tried to reach kids with the gospel and give them a biblical worldview. But I'm here today to tell you this. No matter the enormous efforts of this church and this pastor, it's not enough by itself. It's got to include you and me as parents. ask you a question. You're a parent here this morning. Do you have an intentional plan to disciple your kids? Do you? We've got to have one if we hope to give them a lifelong faith. A good friend of mine, Glenn Schultz, says this. Our children will be discipled by design or by default. By design or by default. See, they're going to get a worldview, whether it's intentional or not. The question is, which one do you want? A biblical one or one this culture shapes for them? I was asked not too many years ago by a parent, why do teenagers think the way they think? Well, I just recently read some research by the Pew Group that said this, that teens will spend six to eight hours a day on some type of media. Six to eight hours a day. Is that where we want their worldview to come from? See, I think sometimes people get confused about what to give their kids growing up. And there's nothing wrong with giving great gifts and things like that to our kids, but it's not the primary thing. I believe the goal of parenting isn't to create perfect, happy kids, but it's to point our kids to a perfect God. How do you do this? And this intentionality factor. How do you develop a lifelong faith by being intentional? Well, you can go back to Paul's protege in the New Testament, Timothy. And the Bible says in the book of Timothy that Timothy was immersed in the scriptures from childhood. That's critical. We've got to be able, ladies and gentlemen, to establish the importance of truth. I promise you that other passage, Deuteronomy 6, look there with me at verse 6 and 7. And it says, you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. You're to repeat them again and again and again to your children. You're to talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Do you see all that? What's it saying? You can read it any any way you want to read it. You can get any translation you want to get. It says this, that we're to teach our kids the things of God every hour they're awake. Every hour they're awake. I was fortunate to grow up in an incredible Christian home. My dad, he he never went beyond high school, but that man was a biblical scholar because he wore Bibles out. He would, I would watch him at night reading that Bible, highlighting, underlining, making notes, filling up notebooks. I'd watch my mom, who was a prayer warrior, nothing humbling as a teenager, like walking by her bedroom, seeing her on her knees before God and heard her calling my name. Why is that important? Because what we believe, what we practice is utterly important. We got to make faith an authentic part of our lives. Even you young people here today, to immerse yourselves in scripture, to immerse yourself in the truth and to build that as the foundation block of your life. Let me ask you a question. Is church a priority? You know, I follow some great preachers on Twitter as I like to see some of the things they post. And some of them will post, had posted a statement out that I, I really thought I liked it first. And it said this, going to church on Sunday is a Saturday night decision. Going to church on Sunday is a Saturday night decision. And I thought about that. Wow, that, that's really good. I might write that down. Then I thought about it some more and prayed about it. I thought, no, I don't like that statement. And I'll tell you why. I really don't believe it's a Saturday night decision. I believe it's a lifestyle decision. I can't imagine growing up and going to my dad on a Saturday night and say, hey, dad, we going to church tomorrow? He'd look back at me and say, boy, what is wrong with you? What's wrong with you? 
It's lifestyle, folks. That's this intentionality factor. It's a lifestyle. If you read Deuteronomy 6, close, really close, talk about it when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Basically, that means the dinner table, the lunch table, the breakfast table, in the car going to and fro. That means bedtime. There is nothing like sitting beside the bed of your little girl at night and praying with her. We're to redeem those moments intentionally. 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 Part of that intentionality factor too is, man, I never wanted anybody to take my kids captive. And kids, teenagers in the room, students in the room, don't let anything take you captive. Colossians 2.8 says this, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spirit and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than Christ. You see folks, I think we need to be concerned with what our kids are led to do, but we may be more concerned with what our kids are led to believe. What they're led to believe. I, was, I told you, I, I focused on what my kids watch, what they listen to, who they hung out with. Those were all important to me. But you know what? The bigger number one priority for me was the number one priority I, we had to establish in our home early on was their spiritual development. It wasn't some other interest. Everything else fell secondary to that. But the number one priority was their spiritual development. What are you modeling today regarding those priorities? It's okay to have other interests but it can't be the top priority. It's okay to have fun. I told you I was an athlete. It's okay to enjoy sports. It's okay to enjoy dance. It's okay to enjoy gymnastics or some other arts. Those are all things God gave us richly to enjoy, but they can't be number one. Don't let anything or take them captive. Hear me, I mentioned to you, I grew up an athlete. But I'll tell you, one of the largest mega, mega movements in America today can be found at the sports complex on Sunday morning. Don't mean to be mean there, but hear, hear me. Let me put it in perspective. The chances of anybody's kid playing professional sports is slim to none. Slim to none. But the chances of them standing before a holy God one day is 100%. 100%. And the last part of this intentionality factor is this. Do it now. Do it now. Barna Research says this. Most kids will die believing what they believe by the age of 12. 97% of, of all people who become Christians, research tells us, will do so, do so by the age of 30. It's never too late. We see a lot of people around this church get saved much later in life. But do it now. Do it now. Never too late, but there's no better time than now. This last factor is the hardest one. It's what I would call the me factor. And by me, I mean you and me as parents and grandparents. Author Christian Smith, who's researched and written books, and he surveyed thousands of teenagers and young adults across this country makes an incredible statement. He said the single most powerful influence on the spiritual lives of kids and young adults is the spiritual lives of their parents. The single most powerful influence is the spiritual life of us on our kids. It's not peers. It's not the medium. It's not youth ministers, even though youth ministers make an incredible difference. It's not pastors, even though pastors make an incredible difference. Folks, it's us as parents and grandparents today. In Luke chapter six, verse 40, Jesus makes an incredible statement. I, I, I hope you'll write this verse down. Luke six forty. The Bible says there that students are not greater than their teacher but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. And that probably applies to some educational context as well. But for us today, the first and most primary teacher of any child is their parents. It's us. They're going to become like us. 
I'll never forget a few years ago, several years ago, one of my girls was probably in about the fourth or fifth grade. And one day at school, she got in a little bit of trouble. Wasn't anything horrible, nothing like that. But she got in a little bit of trouble. And, and, as, and, and as the head of school, I never disciplined my own kids here. I would always wait, get home, be dad. But that particular day, as things played out, there was nobody else here to do it. So it wound up being me. I'll never forget meeting with her, loving on her, dis disciplining her. And I thought, you know, we, she went back. I thought, we're good. It's gonna, we're going to move on. Until the next day, somewhere during the day when I went in my office, she brought back a note and laid it on my desk. It was a long note. And I'll never forget the title of that note. That note said at the top, I am sorry. I'm sorry. And on that note, she probably listed 12 to 15 things on that note. Just incredible. Probably about number 13 or 14, she says, Dad, I'm sorry because I don't want to displease God. But number 15, the very last one on that page, got to my heart. And she said, Dad, I'm sorry because I want to become just like you. And it hit me. She's watching me. She's watching to see if the things that come out of my mouth where I talk about God match my walk. She's watching me to, to see if what I preach about I live out. She's watching. She's watching. Folks, our kids are watching us. They're watching us. I'm going to make a statement to you. I, I, maybe you ought to write it down if you would. But it may be the, the most important takeaway from today. If you, if you don't hear a whole lot else of what I say, I want you to hear this. We replicate who we are spiritually. We replicate who we are spiritually, not who we want to be spiritually. Did you get it? We replicate who we are, the reality of who we are spiritually not who we want to be spiritually. I want to close this morning with an illustration that I'm going to adapt a little bit for Bruce Wilkinson from years ago. It involves three chairs. And they're, conveniently, they're over there in the corner so we don't have to use our imagination. But chair number one, chair number one, I want to put in these three chairs, parents and three different chairs. Chair number one is all about that, those parents who've gone beyond just accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. They're pursuing him. They're doing everything they can do to live for him. They're doing everything they can do to model their faith to their kids. And some of the things we talked about this morning. Chair number two it's full of parents who also are Christians, but they really haven't decided how much or how little they're going to follow Jesus. They have incredibly great intentions, but not consistent. Not consistent in modeling it and living out an authentic faith in front of their kids. Chair number three. This chair is parents who've never trusted Jesus. Never trusted him. Kids have grown up in a good home, but not a Christian home. Now let me tell you a little bit about what the research tells us how this plays out. Chair number one, these parents who've sold out to Christ, 96 plus percent of their kids go on with God the rest of their life. A few stray, but they're more like Proverbs 22, six kids. They come back because they've seen the reality of it lived in front of them. Chair two, kids saw the talk, but never, never saw the walk. Truth is, research tells us that the vast, vast majority of the 70 to 80% who walk away from the church 
and their faith come from chair two. Come from chair two. Chair three, actually, surprisingly, more kids come to Christ in chair three from other resources and other opportunities than from chair two. Why? They weren't jaded in what they saw in inconsistency. You know, the main issue, folks, with our kids and their faith, it's our walk. Make a statement to you. I believe chair two is a dangerous place for our kids. To say we love God and not live it out becomes very dangerous ground for our kids. I mentioned to you author Christian Smith. He made another statement in one of the books I read that he wrote. He said this, one of the top reasons kids leave the church and the faith is they never saw it make a difference in their parents' lives. I didn't come to get on you this morning, but to challenge you and to encourage you. I told you I was competitive. I hate losing kids to the enemy. I hate it. I believe in this generation. I believe in what I see in places like Asbury, Kentucky. They're gonna be the ones that lead revival. It's not gonna be my generation, it's gonna be theirs. But we need to be, we need to be a body of Christ like never before and make a difference with these kids. You know, God gave me my favorite verse for being a parent a few years ago. And that verse is 3 John 4. The Bible says there that there is no greater joy than to see your kids walk in truth. No greater joy. You know, as a minister, I had the privilege of leading my kids to Christ. I had the privilege of baptizing my kids and those were incredibly great days. But the best day for me was when I knew it was theirs and not mine or their mom's. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for this generation to see a multitude of kids who walk in truth. Close with a couple questions. Which chair are you in today? Which one of those are you in? Even as a believer today, if you don't have kids, which chair are you in? Sold out, growing, ambivalent about it, or lost? Which chair are you in? And if you're not in the right chair, would you be willing this morning to get in the right chair? Let's pray together. Heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment. If you're here this morning and you say, Rick, I'm in chair two. I don't wanna be in chair two anymore. I wanna pray for you this morning. Would you, would you be so bold to raise your hand and say, hey, I'm in chair two, I wanna move. Would you go ahead and lift your hand high? I see you, I see hands. God bless you, God bless you. All right, I'm gonna pray for you in just a minute. Maybe this morning you're in chair three. You don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You say, you'd be so bold this morning, Rick, pray for me. I, I, I want to come to know Jesus. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you. All right. God bless you. God bless you. Here's what you do. If, you, if you're in that chair three this morning, there's no magic formula. Pray out to God and pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm in need of a Savior. Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins? Come into my life. And Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life. And like I said, no magic, but call out to him. The Bible says in Romans 10, if we call out to him, he'll be faithful to change us and save us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you for this incredible worship we've experienced today. Lord, I pray that through all the mumbling and bumbling and stumbling I may have done today, that your word will penetrate the hearts of your people. Father, I pray for those who raised their hand this morning and said, I'm in chair two. Lord, I pray that you give them courage and conviction 
to do what's necessary to make the steps back toward chair one. Lord, for those who prayed or who raised their hand and and said, hey, I'm in chair three. Father, I pray that you just give them the boldness before they leave this auditorium today to find somebody here on staff with a lift or me and say, I prayed that with you. Father, I pray that you would energize each of us in this room today. We don't want the devil to win with these kids anymore. Give us the courage and the boldness to do whatever it takes to reach this generation and give them the tools they need to turn this culture around for you. Father, we love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What an awesome challenge from uh, Rick Calloway today about how to be better parents and how to raise a family and how to honestly be more intentional with our kids. I know I was very encouraged by that, but I was also challenged. I have a two-year-old and one on the way, but this just gives me perspective on what it means to be a God-fearing parent and to encourage and challenge our children as we raise them to not only love God, not only fear God, but want to walk with Him and serve Him completely. And so, awesome. What, what, a, what an awesome challenge that we received today. I want to challenge you. Don't just let this live in your notepad or your iPad or wherever you took notes or wherever you listened to. I want you to digest this, and I want you to put it into practice. And it doesn't have to be something that you do in a couple of weeks. Do it today. Be intentional today. Take a step and be a better parent Take, take a step, be a better auntie, uncle, grandma, grandpa, whatever it is, because the next generation is dependent upon you to be present. But like I said, it's been an awesome day. Again, if you said yes to Jesus, we want you to text I said yes to this number that's going to come up on our screen. We want to learn how we can come alongside you and help you on your journey as you're beginning to walk with Jesus, because here's the reality. We can't do this all by ourselves. We were made to do life together with Jesus. And so we want to encourage you. Like I said, text this number. Also, you can even type in the chat room uh, that you said yes. Uh, We want to be able to connect with you. We don't want you to fall through the cracks. We want to be able to resource you and equip you well to follow Jesus. But like I said earlier, it's been a great day in the house of the Lord. Father's Day is next week. If you haven't got your present, go get it. It's going to be a great week. We'll see you next time.